Native Alaskans supporting their local football team, the Whalers. What do they think about the plans for much more drilling? This is a community facing massive change and a momentous choice. People here are American citizens and they do benefit from oil revenues. You might assume they'd want more. Barrow is America's northernmost town. And with big American cars and half the population employed by a wealthy local government, it seems firmly committed to the modern world. But this is also a very traditional society. This, this actually is the main harpoon, isn't it? This is, a, this is a harpoon. Eugene Brower is a whaling captain, a leading figure in Barrow. Hunting is a central part of Alaskan culture. He fears that drilling in the ocean could contaminate the waters, that his hunting grounds offshore could be ruined by oil. Oil ain't everything. What about the human beings that live up here, up and down the coast, gone down the coastline? What about our way of life? We may be few thousand in number, but this ocean has given us our food chain to, for us to live, to survive. And I'm not about to give that up just for the sake of the, the big oil giants to come out here saying that, that they can do whatever they want to do. Why not against them? Just show us, prove to us that you have the necessary equipment and the infrastructure to combat the oil spill. Show it to us. Don't talk about it. Talking is cheap. Doing is another. So let's see. Let's put their money where their mouth is. So these people are at a crossroads. Their culture is based on the wildlife, but the oil industry brings them jobs and cash. Some do want more drilling, especially on land, but the prospect of rigs out at sea is meeting more determined resistance. That opposition to drilling in the ocean is rooted in the ancient tradition of surviving by hunting the great creatures of the Arctic, and that's still a key part of life here now, which was brought home to me when the polar bear that we've just been filming was spotted up the beach by a local hunter and shot dead. When we find the bear, it's being skinned, and people are a bit defensive. You know, you hear all the stuff on the, on the, the news that the polar bear is endangered or on the starving. starving to death. Well, this dude's got a lot of fat on him. He wasn't, he's not starving to death. <laughs> right. So you reckon well, there are plenty of bears around? Then? Oh, I'm sure there is. The media are accused of bias against this hunting culture. You know, they'll sit here and say the polar bear is endangered and we, uh, we, we got to save them and, and we shouldn't shoot them. Well, you know, people up here eat them. And they always will. This community is strong, but so is the pressure for oil. There's a tough battle ahead, one of many in this changing Arctic. And mark, mark, mark. Just cross the Arctic Circle. Right on, uh, We're on an American Coast Guard patrol plane. Suddenly, the authorities are waking up to this rapidly warming region. It's forcing a dramatic shift. And this is why. There's now a lot of water where there used to be ice. The summer melt has been so extreme, the ice cap has retreated hundreds of miles further than normal. Well, to get this spectacular view, my cameraman and I are very well strapped in. But it gives you a sense of the extraordinary change up here. Open water in the Arctic for the second year running, an incredible degree of melting, far faster than the experts had predicted. And the implications of this are huge. The melt is so rapid that forces like the American Coast Guard are scrambling to get a toehold here. We are going to have water more of the time more of the year in the Arctic, and that the world, in fact, was coming to the Arctic, the world of large ships, and I was not prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for 
cruise ships and major vessel casualties. I wasn't prepared for oil spills, potential oil spills in the Arctic. I wasn't prepared for any of the other missions we do in the Arctic. And this initiative throughout this past year and mostly this summer has been designed to determine, one, what is actually happening here, two, what do we need to do here, three, how do we do it, and four, uh, what's it going to take? I mean, I, above all, I, I don't have the resources to do this in a sustained way. In the last count, the Russians have got 14 heavy icebreakers. By my reckoning, you've got two. Uh, where does that leave the states in the Arctic? I will often state in perfect candor that uh, in the Arctic race, uh, the United States is dead last among the Arctic nations. We are the least prepared uh, to uh, conduct normal governmental operations in the Arctic. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm concerned about is helping America realize that they have uh, this issue and to, become, to help get them prepared. The Coast Guard mounted a big Arctic exercise this summer. One major worry in these treacherous waters, how to rescue ships that get into trouble. There are no bases here, communications are difficult, but the Arctic is becoming popular as a destination for cruise ships. This site is very much in mind, the sinking of the Explorer near Antarctica last year. A sturdy cruise ship wrecked by an iceberg. Everyone was saved this time. At this Coast Guard headquarters, we join a training flight. Here at Kodiak Island in southern Alaska, the rescue teams already contend with hostile conditions. Pushing north into the Arctic will be far tougher. The fear is of an Arctic Titanic. So, what do you guys think of these huge cruise ships that come into these waters? When you get these enormous cruise ships moving in well, further north from here into the Arctic. But you can imagine a Titanic type scenario and uh, it's unthinkable. You know, you can't prepare too much for a cruise ship in the Arctic waters. The training also has a military edge. Here, they're firing blanks but the exercise is to rehearse defending an oil installation from attack. There are five countries on the edge of the Arctic and all of them are involved in disputes over their borders. So the melting could trigger confrontation. There's always a risk of conflict, especially where you do not have established, delineated, agreed upon borders. The philosophy though has got to be one of cooperation because competition or conflict in the Arctic is not gonna help anyone and it's going to do a lot of damage to an otherwise fragile ecosystem. The, really, the, the, the only answer that makes sense is for everyone to cooperate and work together. And the first flashpoint, well, maybe these fishing boats will be involved. Fishing is big business, but the Arctic boundaries out at sea aren't settled. Russia is just next door and becoming more assertive. Even now, it's hard to guard the stocks. We have that um, difficulty already on the maritime boundary line with the Russians as the Pollock fisheries, the stocks move north and south and, and move over the Russian line and back onto our side of the line. They skirt the edge and, and our fishermen skirt the edge as well. Um, and that's a big part of what the Coast Guard does in the summertime is to monitor that line and, and keep the Russians off of our side of the line. So opening up the Arctic um, and possibly whatever fisheries might be out there, even if it's worth going to fish for them, that just, again, makes that area bigger, that we've got to go out and patrol and, and keep them away from our fish. It's all changing so fast. At Barrow, even these ancient graves are at risk. Usually ice protects the shoreline, but with less ice these days, storms can lash the coast, so this cemetery is having to be moved. This forlorn region was once frozen and forgotten. Now these warming waters are the focus of global attention, home to precious resources, a tinderbox 
of competing claims. There are calls for an Arctic treaty to settle the disputes, but with the melting so rapid, will that come in time? 